For our experts in emotion interview, we will be speaking with Dr. Nancy Eisenberg on emotion regulation in children. Dr. Eisenberg is a Regents Professor of Psychology at Arizona State University. Her research interests pertain to social, emotional, and moral development, and her books include The Caring Child, The Roots of Prosocial Behavior in Children, and How Children Develop. Dr. Eisenberg has been editor of Psychological Bulletin and Child Development Perspectives and has received career contribution awards from the American Psychological Association, the Association for Psychological Science, and the International Society for Research on Behavioral Development. I now turn to our Experts in Emotion interview with Dr. Nancy Eisenberg on emotion regulation in children. So welcome, Nancy. Thank you for speaking with us today. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Joan. What I thought might be a nice way to start off our conversation is to ask you a little bit about what first got you interested in emotion. Um, well, I was still studying moral development. And um, back when I started, there wasn't really a field of emotion. Mm -hmm. um, I was studying uh, moral reasoning and empathy. And um, assessing empathy back then, people did it with uh, people's, particularly children's, self-reports to stories. And make a long story short, we found that wasn't working very well with children. And so we started to um, try to use some nonverbal measures like uh, physiological measures. Mm -hmm. So I had to start reading the physiological literature because I was trying to get it empathic arousal. Um, and uh, use skin conductance heart rate to get it arousal in children. And that takes you into the emotion literature. Also, through our work, we found that there were some kids who uh, were more empathic, and they were also seemed to be more socially competent in general, while the kids who were um, less socially competent were more prone to what we call personal distress, which is the tendency to experience um, aversive emotions when confronted with someone else's negative emotion. And so I started thinking about why this might be. And it led me into thinking about the ability to regulate emotions successfully and how that may play out in children's social behavior. And so I had to start thinking about individual differences in emotionality and also the ability to modulate that emotionality. So it was really coming from the empathy literature that led me at first, uh, unbeknownst to myself really, into the emotion literature. So I wanted to then ask you a few questions about your research that's been just so influential in this domain. So I mean, you're widely known for, you know, your pioneering work in the study of developmental processes that have been vital for healthy social and emotional responding in children. And I wonder from your perspective what you see as some of the most critical discoveries in your work on emotion regulation in children. Um, well, uh, some of them have to do with empathy, but I think we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Uh, so I'll wait on that. Um, uh, we tried to differentiate between emotion-related regulatory processes that were more ethical, um, coming out of the temperament literature. There's a discussion of these kind of effortful control processes, and also processes that affect behavior but seem to be a little less voluntary, harder to regulate, what we call reactive control, like the child who's impulsive and always approaching but has trouble inhibiting that or a child who seems to be very regulated maybe because they don't they're sitting still they're not getting into trouble but they're actually overly inhibited and having difficulty approaching new situations dealing with new people so um, what people call behavioral inhibition so we've been interested in these more processes the kid can easily manage, like make themselves regulate, stop a behavior, or make themselves activate a behavior even when they don't want to, voluntarily shift and focus attention when they have to, versus these other kind of behaviors like impulsivity and uh, behavioral inhibition where they 
the child seems to have less control, but it does affect, in a sense, regulate their behavior and outcomes for them. And we showed that, actually more recently, uh, statistically, we can really differentiate these two kinds of processes, but also they provide unique prediction of psychopathology and uh, symptoms, uh, you know, externalizing problems, particularly to some degree internalizing problems like social withdrawal and anxiety, uh, but also social competence um, uh, and uh, empathy and pro-social behavior, other kinds of aspects of social competence. So that's one important thing. Um, actually, when we started doing the work in the early 90s, there wasn't really much good research. There was a little, but there wasn't much good research that used measures that assessed something really close to regulation rather than a general kind of doing good at everything. Mm -hmm. um, so. The early measures often threw together emotionality and regulation, a regulation and social competence. And so we tried to sort out and get cleaner measures. And we had longitudinal data in the 90s and then thereafter. So we were one of the early people to document how important these early individual differences in regulatory, these voluntary, voluntary regulatory processes were for predicting outcomes for kids later. Um, for instance, in our first study, we had teachers and parents just reporting on kids' ability to focus and shift attention. Mm -hmm. And we found that it not only related to kids' ability to manage anger at that age, their popularity, their social competence more broadly, but it predicted two, four, and six years later into the school setting, problem behaviors at home. So we were surprised how powerful a predictor just these ratings were from teachers and preschool. And that really got us interested in following um, the kids and longer and looking at uh, motion regulation in more detail. <clears throat> but um, yeah. so, so mapping out some of those pathways, uh, which a lot of people are doing now, but people weren't doing it as much then. I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about what you see as particularly important about the role of adaptive and flexible autonomic responding when it comes to you know, healthy emotion regulation processes in children as well. Uh, by autonomic, are you talking physiological? Yeah, exactly. Oh, um, well, I guess, uh, um, I was thinking of more aut automatic, but um, well, I think, hmm, so it'd be more like a bagel tone. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, kids who can manage uh, um, the vagal system, which is seen, it's to do with heart rate and respiration, and it's seen as a system that affects kids' um, physiological emotion regulation. And uh, kids who have what we call high vagal tone seem to be able to, um, they have a more flexible system. They can suppress the system so that the uh, arousal rises when need be in situations. Um, and it seems to affect their, maybe be related to their ability to focus attention. And so, it's important that kids be able to change their attention and their arousal with the context. Um, for instance, focus in on something strongly uh, and shut out other uh, aspects of the environment when they need to. Um, I'm not, I don't think we really know very well how that relates to the effortful control. It does correlate in some studies with mm -hmm. these effortful control processes I've been talking about, but not that well. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think we know enough about how like the voluntary attention process processes and the ability to activate and regulate behavior as needed relate to those autonomic systems because the literature isn't that consistent. 
Sounds um, like it's an important direction for future research yes. to really parse apart those nuances. Yes, and it, I think it depends on context. Um, a mm -hmm. student of mine just uh, did a master's that's being published uh, soon that he found, for instance, vagal tone was correlated with measures of uh, FFO control, behavioral measures of self-regulation mm -hmm. in a laboratory uh, situation only for kids who were shy hmm. because for those kids it seemed to be they really had to bring the effort for control to bear in that situation mm -hmm. um, to do well mm -hmm. and so for them the relationship was stronger mm -hmm. uh, than for kids that weren't shy in this laboratory situation it might be very mm -hmm. different in a non-laboratory sure. so it's really interesting work you're doing. Um, it makes me want to ask you also about another line of work that I think you alluded to earlier, which is the critical work that you've conducted on the study of children's capacity for empathy or the ability to try to really understand the emotions of others in their environment. And I wondered if you could describe what you see as the critical role of these empathy-related behaviors and adaptive social behavior and adjustment. Okay. Um, well, one thing we tried to do, and building on the work of Dan Batson, who's a mm -hmm. social psychologist, was differentiate different empathy-related responses. Mm -hmm. um, people used to use the word empathy to refer to just about any emotional response to somebody else's uh, emotion that wasn't totally off the wall and, I mean, somewhat related to what the other person's feeling. Um, we differentiated empathy, which we call, we really make, define that as feeling a highly similar emotion as the other person. And we differentiated that from sympathy, which is concern for mm -hmm. the other person. So I can feel sadness when you're sad, which would be empathy, but then if I feel concern for you, that would be sympathy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then Dan Batson talked about personal distress, which is when the emotions become so aversive that I'm fo like, say you're sad and it makes me anxious and dep or depressed or stressed. And those emotions are aversive and I focus on myself. Mm -hmm. So it's too arousing. I mean, we can all think of times where somebody's telling us something that bad that happened to them and we can hardly bear listening because it's making us anxious. That would be personal distress. Mm -hmm. And that differentiation is very important because they relate to different behaviors. Um, it's the sympathy particularly and maybe sometimes empathy, but we think empathy often leads to sympathy. Mm -hmm. um, that relates to helping others, to being more socially competent. Uh, being sensitive, uh, and personal distress actually is associated with trying to avoid the other person that is evoking the emotion in us, and also um, is not related to uh, better social competence. Um, uh, I'm getting a cup of coffee. No, that's fine. I wondered if I could... Um, ask you about, I mean, this is just really fascinating, and I wanted to ask you about just a third area of your work that looks at the relationship between uh, parental emotional expressivity and the development of children's regulatory abilities and broader kind of socio-emotional functioning. And I wondered if you could speak to what you see as the most central findings on this inner relationship mm -hmm. between a parent and the emotional well-being and regulatory capacity of the child. Can I say one more thing about the last sure. issue? Though? Sure. One thing I didn't mention is the lack of empathy. Mm -hmm. And, the, you know, most kids do experience some empathy, but there's some kids that don't experience much. Mm -hmm. And that's the really scary uh, situation, I think. Um, not experiencing empathy for others, it seems to be part of psychopathic kinds of tendencies where kids can be cruel and manipulative and so forth. So empathy sensitizes us and maybe often may inhibit aggression. If we start feeling the other's distress when we start to do something bad to them, hit them, whatever, we're less likely to do those kinds of behaviors. Hmm. So I think 
empathy can be an inhibitor of problematic behavior. Interesting. Um, so on the parenting issue, mm -hmm. oh gosh, there's so much one could talk about depending mm -hmm. yeah. what outcome you're interested in. But if I had to pick, you know, a few most important things mm -hmm. uh, and kind of focus more in on the emotion side mm -hmm. rather than, say, aggression or other kinds of issues, sure. um, certainly parents being supportive, uh, being supportive of the child's emotions, trying to talk about emotions, at least in this culture, I should say that some of these parenting behaviors may not be work the same way in other cultures. Um, uh, being sensitive to the child's wants and needs and feelings, expressing um, a positive emotion with the child when dealing with the child when appropriate, of course, uh, uh, not overly expressing hostile, negative emotions in the home or in interactions with the child. Of course, it, you have to at some times, and it's part of everyday life. But if the home atmosphere is more these hostile kinds of emotions and warm, supportive emotions, kids, that's associated with a lot of negative outcomes for children. Mm -hmm. um, in regard to kind of learning to manage emotions, and uh, being well regulated in regard to emotions, probably also the the issue of um, discussing, coaching children, discussing emotions, not avoiding talking about dealing with emotions in a natural way in everyday situations. Uh, you know, parents can ask the child why they feel a certain way, talk to them about how that's natural, what what can one do about it? Uh, how can you feel? What can you do to make yourself feel better? These kinds of behaviors seem to be very useful in helping kids learn to regulate their emotions. And in fact, in John Gottman's work, uh, going back has also been related to this vagal uh, tone ability. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Some people call it RSA, by the way. But um, it's uh, the mother, the parents who were high in meta emotion, able to accept emotion, talk about emotion, deal with it, had kids that had better vagal tone. Um, so it's all interconnected there. Sure. Uh, so those would be important, but you know, yeah. parenting, uh, there's lots of aspects that are uh, important, and in, including reasonable rule setting and high expectations, not excessively high that it's impossible, but depending on the outcome um, the parent wants. Also modeling. Mm -hmm. I mean, modeling empathy. I, I mean, who knows where genetics comes in here, but parents that are more sympathetic have kids that are more sympathetic. Mm -hmm. You know, parents that are more pro-social have kids that are more pro-social. Part of that may be genetically transmitted, but pro probably part of it's modeling. What implications do you think these findings might have for trying to develop, you know, emotion-focused interventions for, for children, you know? Um, well, people are already doing them, sometimes without calling that. Yeah. The uh, PAVS curriculum of Mark Greenberg, for instance, mm -hmm. is designed to deal with problem behaviors uh, primarily. Mm -hmm. But what they do is teach kids about their own and others' emotions, how to identify them, uh, what they are, how to um, differentiate emotions, what do you do about emotions, uh, um, what are strategies one can use when you're angry, for instance, at another child. Uh, they teach them self-regulatory techniques, like um, they have a picture of a stoplight on the wall and you know, talk about look at the light, stop, think before you do something when you're upset. So uh, actually a number of the interventions out there involve teaching about emotion and emotion regulation, and they do have some effects, particularly for the kids that have the most problems. Um, there's not so many with parenting, and it seems to me that that's an area that is really ripe for more research. Mm 
helping. There are, uh, Susan Landry's done some work that teaches parents kind of best practices of socialization, the kind of thing I was just mm -hmm. talking about, mm -hmm. being supportive, a sensitive, using appropriate discipline. And kids have a number of good outcomes that seem to, if you seem to reflect uh, better regulation. Um, but there's very little work where parents are taught how to coach children about emotions, mm -hmm. teach them strategies, how to talk effectively about emotions, um, these kinds of strategies. So I think that's an area that could be developed a lot more. So as you think about where the future of this field is headed and what areas could be developed more, what would you say as you look forward? Where, where are the most important discoveries going to be? going to be made in your in your eyes? Well, in the prevention areas we were just talking about, there's yeah. a lot to be done. Um, I think one could use a lot of this information more than we currently are, mm -hmm. particularly outside. We're doing a better job in the schools than outside of the schools. But, you know, if the schools are teaching children about emotions and emotion regulation, but they have a terrible environment at home, it probably helps some, but we could do a lot more probably if we mm -hmm. could get the parents to complement the school intervention. And some people are trying to do that, but to a very limited degree. Um, obviously, the work in the biological areas is uh, important, the neuro, uh, neuropsych and so forth, where they're trying to map some of the circuits to do with emotion, emotion regulation, how do these all connect um, how do we make decisions then? Um, this is going to be very important, and, and I think it's going to dominate the field, actually. I think it's extremely important, but I also think it's really important we don't lose sight of behavior and the environment. Um, those inputs, uh, genetics is getting very important. People are looking at uh, genetic differences related to emotion, emotion regulation, but we really need to look at how these interact with the environment, um, the home environment, the school environment, to because that seems to affect how the genes play out, the genetic tendencies. Um, and uh, I think this work is really the wave of the future, but I'm a little concerned that the environment and um, other aspects are going to get lost in the rush um, to find totally, mostly biological solutions and mm -hmm. uh, answers to the questions. So then yeah. what advice do you have for future students who are thinking about embarking in this area? What might you tell them? Um, get as multi-method as you can. Mm -hmm. uh, it's important to learn a whole array, I mean, I think learning some about biological measures, learning about behavioral measures, um, uh, learning, you know, facial expressions. There's all kinds of ways to get at these, the phenomenon related to emotion, emotion regulation, and their outcomes. Um, so the broader the toolbox you have in terms of methods, the better. Um, also, uh, to not just stick to one literature. If you're a developmentalist, read the adult literature. If you're a social psychologist, the developmental literature is critical. Read the clinic, you know, clinicians are doing a lot of work, obviously relevant, uh, the biological areas. I mean, now we have to be reading papers in a lot of the biological journals. Um, you really need to get cross areas in psychology, but also even into other disciplines much more than in the past. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for speaking with us today, Nancy. Mm -hmm. It's my pleasure. <laughs> so this concludes our Experts in Emotion interview with Dr. Nancy Eisenberg from Arizona State University. Thank you so much again.